See, I want you to know today that you are in control of your life and not anybody else. You are in control of you. You are in control of your life. You see, all of us have power. All of us have authority to choose how we live, to choose whether or not we will live for the better. So in my sermon today, I want to encourage you again to live for the better by taking control over your life so that you can prosper as the Lord has always desired for all of us to do. Will you take control today over your life? So I feel my message this week, it is a two pronged message in that this week, we need to understand our power. We need to understand our authority. And at the same time, because I brought up the word prosper there, I feel that we need to have an understanding of what prosperity is, not according to man, but prosperity according to the Lord. God has given all of us the same power in that we are all able to choose to live for the better. Other Lord's desire for us to live for the better. We will see James write and say there in the 18th verse. James, he writes that the Lord brought us forth by the word of truth. So that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In other words, so that we may prosper is what James says there. Again, I want to reference to all of you today when we speak about God's desire for us. I want to reference the first chapter of Genesis again in the 26th verse. And there in that 26th verse again, we will see where the Godhead said, when creating mankind, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. In his image and in his likeness, we know that again, we were created holy, that we were created righteous, that we were created perfect. Now, we may not be perfect today, but the opportunity is there for us to, again, become holy. The opportunity is there for us to, again, become righteous. The opportunity is there again for us to be perfect. Will you take advantage of this opportunity? Will you use this power to become holy, to become righteous and to become perfect? Now, when we think of God, the first thing that we think of is that God is all powerful. Ain't that the first thing that you think of when you think about God? That's the first thing that I think of when I think about God. I I think about how God is sovereign. I think about how the Lord has all authority how God has power and authority over all things known and unknown. That's the first thing that I think of Mm -hmm. when I think about God. I think about that God, when he moves, he moves as he pleases. He moves as he desires. Mm -hmm. He moves according to his own will. And many of us, we, we may question the way that God moves, but there ain't nothing that we can do about it. When God moves, he's going to move. He's going to move how he pleases to move. And there ain't nothing that any of us can do about it, no matter how powerful we think we are in this world. We can't make God do anything. And when God does something and we feel like it's wrong, we can't correct them on it, can we? 
as it was said to Job, God is exalted by his power. And it was asked of Job, who teaches? Who teaches like him? It was asked of Job, who has assigned him his way or who has said you have done wrong to God mm-hmm. and been able to do something about the wrong that God has supposedly done. Right. Again, people try to tell God what he ought to do. Mm-hmm. But again, when God moves, there ain't nothing we can do about it. We can't challenge his power. Andrew, you can't challenge his authority, can you? Mm-hmm. Andrew said, nope. Do you realize come on, come on. that you were created with power and with authority given to you? Right. Again, I want you to remember here today what we read there in the first chapter of Genesis and the 26th verse. Mm-hmm. We were created in the image of and in the likeness of the Lord. Power and authority, I want you to know today, it is in your nature. Mm -hmm. God created you with that nature. Mm -hmm. We'll see there in the 26th and in the 28th verse there in the first chapter of Genesis, if you happen to be looking at it, that the Lord gave mankind this world to have dominion over. God, we will see state there in those two verses. He said, let them, the them there being us mankind, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Then the Lord said there, When it came to us, mankind, Mm -hmm. he said, be fruitful, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, the Lord said, and listen to this, subdue it. Mm -hmm. Power and authority is in your nature. Mm -hmm. Dominion, subdue, we see the Lord say there. Dominion is authority. It is absolute ownership. In other words, dominion is absolute control. When when we speak of subdue, to subdue something means to conquer. Mm -hmm. To to subdue something means to bring it under Mm -hmm. your control. It means you have the power to bring something under your control. Now, yes, God has given to us dominion over this world. And some of us will view our dominion over this world as a great power and Mm -hmm. and, and a great authority. Mm -hmm. But I want you to understand today that God has given to you an even greater power. He's given to you an even greater authority than having dominion over the world and even subduing the world as well. God has given us authority that far exceeds having dominion over this world. You see, when God created us in his image and in his likeness, God created us with this nature, his nature of free will. You and I were created to have free will. Free will, I want you to understand today that it is a great power. Mm -hmm. I I tell you today that there is no greater power than free will. There is no greater power that one can have than being able to choose to move as they desire to move. To be able to do what they desire to do. In other words, to be able to live as they desire to live. There is no greater power than this, your free will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As early as Adam and Eve in the garden, before mankind's fall in the garden, 
we see free will. We see that man had the power to choose to either live for the better or not. It is true that after Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that the Lord spoke to how mankind had become like him in knowing what is good and knowing what is evil. That is certainly true. However, again, free will, I want you to understand, is something that that man has always had because God created us in his image and in his likeness. You see, God gave Adam and Eve the power of free will to choose between obedience and disobedience right there in the garden. I'm not making that up. You see, when God explicitly told them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we know that there was a period of time there where Adam and Eve chose not to eat from the tree. They made that choice by their own free will. It was in their nature Mm -hmm. to choose to live for the better or not. Mm -hmm. So when they both ate from the tree, we should understand today Mm -hmm. that they did so by their own volition, Mm -hmm. by their own choice. Mm -hmm. They deliberately chose to disobey the Lord. Free will. Mm -hmm. That is how they use their power. That is how they use their authority. Now, some will ask and some will say they'll bring up the old devil because that's what we love to do. Say, hey, what about the devil? What about Satan? Preacher, he was there in the garden. Adam and Eve, I want you to understand, they had authority over their own actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they chose. Mm -hmm. The devil did not force them to do anything. Mm -hmm. They chose. They used their power and their authority, their free will, their choice. Mm -hmm. They did. You and I, we have authority over our thoughts. Mm -hmm. We have authority over our feelings. We have authority over our actions. Mm -hmm. This is something that that we must come to understand today Mm -hmm. is that we have authority over who we are. We have authority Mm -hmm. over what we do. Yes, I tell you today that our power and our authority, it is always going to be under attack. Mm -hmm. Satan, our great enemy, is always going to challenge the authority that we have to be able to choose. He's going to always try to influence us. He's going to always try to persuade us. Mm -hmm. But again, we have the power. You are in control of your thoughts of your feelings and of your actions. You see, I'm not going to let Satan rob you. I'm not going to let Satan rob me of my power and my authority, which were given to us by the Lord. Again, I want you to know today that you are in control. You see, we must own up to, and we must take responsibility for the actions that we choose to take in our lives, we must take responsibility for the decisions Mm -hmm. that we make in our lives today as well. We must take responsibility for when we choose to heed wise counsel Mm -hmm. or not. There are no excuses for any of us today. So yes, while Satan is our great enemy, I tell you today that if you were to look in a mirror, Mm -hmm. our greatest enemy will be staring back at us. If you don't get what I am saying here, Mm -hmm. I want you to understand today 
that we are our own worst enemy. You see, we must understand that the power and authority that we have today is in our hands. We are in control of our lives. You must come to understand that, again, ultimately, you are in control of whether or not you live for the better or not. I asked at the beginning of the year, do you desire to live for the better? And I ask you again today, do you desire to live for the better? Like I said in my sermon last week, we choose how we live in this world. You see, we choose whether we will think positively. We choose whether we think negatively. We choose whether we will be happy. We choose whether we will be sad. We choose whether we will be stressed or not stressed, anxious or not anxious. As Paul said to the Romans, as much as it depends on us, we all have the power today to choose whether or not we will live peaceably with all of those that are around us. Again, we are in control. You are in control of your life today. As the Lord did for Adam and Eve, he has done the same for us if we truly desire to live for the better. And somebody will ask, well, what, what did God do? Well, God, he gave us his instructions. God has given us his instructions. And I tell you today that the instructions that God has given to us are instructions that we ought to live by if we truly desire to live for the better. The first thing that the Lord advised us to do if we desire to live for the better he advised us to have faith, not in somebody else, not in some other God. He said that we need to have faith in him and in him alone. So God, I say to you today, should be your hope if you desire to live for the better. If you desire to live for the better, you should depend on the Lord, I say to you today, right. and not something else or anybody else. And Jesus told us that whatever we ask in his name, yeah. Jesus said that he will do it mm -hmm. so that the father may be glorified in the son. Yeah. Yeah. As James said, our faith, it should never doubt the Lord. God, again, should be our hope. You see, God is always going to lead us to our blessings if we hope in him, if we trust in him, if we depend on him, if our faith is genuine in him. And we do not doubt. God is always going to carry you to your blessing. You're always going to be living for the better. The second thing that the Lord advised us to do, right. if we desire to live for the better, mm -hmm. he advised us to eat the bread which came down from heaven right. and gave his life to the world. Mm -hmm. In John's gospel, we read about how Jesus called for the Jews to consume him. Because as Jesus said, he is the bread that came down from heaven and dwelt among us. As I said in my first sermon of uh, this year, we ought to desire to live for the better by eating, by digesting, by consuming the word of God. You and I, we should fully eat the word of God. We should fully consume it. We should digest it so that the word of God becomes a part of our being. And by it becoming a part of our being, we walk by the word of God. We talk by the word of God. We move 
by the word of God. We would live for the better, I tell you, in every state of our being. If we were to eat the word of God, if we were to consume it wholly, if we were to digest it today, I tell you that we will be better physically, Mm -hmm. that we will be better mentally, Mm -hmm. that we will be better emotionally, that we will be better spiritually as well. In other words, when we choose with our power to live by the word of God, we are making a choice to live a healthier life. You are in control to choose to live a healthier life spiritually today. However, when you choose to consume, to digest the word of the world, which is the word of sin, I tell you today that you are making a poor decision health-wise, spiritually. And in every state, you are going to be living unhealthy, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You are making the worst decision of your life. Now ask yourself this question. Why did the Lord share this wise counsel with all of us? Why did he give us his instructions? Why did he give us his word? The Lord, as we already know, he shared this wise counsel with us so that we can live for the better, so that we could do better. The Lord, I want you to understand today, He gave you his instructions so that you can prosper Mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. There's that word prosper. And again, I tell you, I feel like we, we need to take a moment here to, to dive into that word prosper. I feel like we need to understand prosperity here. Mm -hmm. You see, if you think about this for a moment, When God initially created mankind, as we've seen there in the first chapter of Genesis and in the 26th verse, he created us to be fruitful. He created us to multiply. He created us to prosper. Mm -hmm. To prosper, it means to grow. Mm -hmm. To prosper, it means to thrive. Mm -hmm. To prosper, it means to increase. To prosper, it means to gain. Now, When we think about this word in our old nature, with our carnal mind, in a worldly manner, if you will, we begin to think about how we can add on to our wealth. You know, what we have in our bank account, all of our possessions. You know, somebody here, preacher, start preaching about prosperity, and they'll be like, okay, preacher, preacher, something I can get now. I can get into this because preacher talked about me adding on to my bank account and, and adding on to my riches, my treasures. However, again, when you look back to when God created mankind, you'll see that God did not have worldly treasures in his mind. God didn't create us to go out and gather gold. God didn't create you to to grind and hustle for silver. He didn't create you to grind and hustle for the riches of this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, if you think about it, when Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, they didn't have to grind and hustle for anything. See, God attended to their every need. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you suppose that the Lord desires to do for you today? Does God not desire to attend to our every need? Hasn't God called for us to to pray to him diligently so that he can supply our every need? Isn't that what God has has desired to do for us this whole time is to attend to our every need? God desires to care for us, doesn't he? I tell you today that the Lord will supply your every need. 
today if you choose him over everything. When God says that his thoughts towards us are of peace, a future, and a hope, I want you to know today that he's not dreaming of giving us great wealth that is in this world. That is not on his mind. And I know that's going to upset somebody today because that's what always stays on our mind. You know, that's what's on our mind, on some of our minds right now this moment. But how they can go out and get some more money how they can go out and get some more shoes, how they can go out and get some more clothes. You see, that's what stays on our mind. But again, God's thoughts are not like our thoughts. They supersede our thoughts. They are far above our thoughts. His way is higher than our way. So I want you to understand clearly today that the Lord, he wants you to prosper. But God's focus is not about this world. Again, his focus is not on earthly treasures. The reality of the matter is this. When Jesus spoke about treasures and talked about storing up treasures, he said, store up your treasures in heaven. That was what was on his mind. Prosperity was about heaven. When it came to Jesus, God in the flesh. He said, don't store treasures in this world where man can rob it, where it will rust, where it will decay, where it will ultimately be destroyed. If you're going to store up your treasures anywhere, store it up where it won't be destroyed, where it cannot be robbed. Store it up in heaven. So when we talk about spirit, uh, prosperity, when we talk about it spiritually, Prosperity, I want you to understand, it is about growth. It is about improvement as a person, as a being. It is about improving on who you are in your soul today. Prosperity is about being the best person that you possibly can be and continuing to grow in that person. Our growth, our prosperity leads to us being able to bear fruit, not any kind of fruit. Our prosperity leads to us bearing good fruit. And when you and I, when we prosper today and when we bear fruit, it is not just for ourselves, our growth and our prosperity. It is for all of those that are around us. So my overall thought for this series of sermons that I have preached this month, it is boiled down to our power, our control in choosing to live for the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Frankly, I would tell you that the choice to choose to live for the better, it is an easy choice to make, mm -hmm. especially if you love yourself, you see, if you love yourself, then you're going to do right by yourself. You are going to make the best decision possible for yourself. And so again, the best decision that is possible for yourself, is it not the decision to choose God over everything oh, yes. Yes. to, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson today, is it not to choose to walk in the spirit? Mm -hmm. You are in control and you have the power to do this. Mm -hmm. What will you do today? Will you choose to live for the better? Will you choose to love yourself enough? To live for the better. That's the problem that a lot of us have today. We think we love ourselves, but we're not making that decision that actually shows that we love ourselves. We're not making the decision to love the Lord with our whole heart. We're not making the decision to choose God over everything. We continue to choose the world. We continue to choose Worldly riches. And yet we're saying that we love 
ourselves. It don't sound like you love you if you keep picking the world over yourself. Now, when I call for us to love ourselves, there are a few things that I want us to understand. For one, I'm not talking about loving your outer, outward appearance. I am talking about loving yourself wholly. Again, I'm talking about loving yourself not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually as well. And so I ask you today, do you love yourself? Do you love the way that you operate? In other words, do you love the way that you act? Do you love the way that you think? Do, the, do you love the way that you feel? In other words, spiritually speaking, I'm asking you this. Do you love who you are? Do you love what you have become? To me, that's, that's such a deep question. Do you love who you are and do you love who you have become? It's it's so deep of a question that I would hope that all of us would say yes, but the truth of the matter is, is that some of us, we aren't going to say yes. And to those of us that won't say yes to that question, I again say to you today that you have the power, you are in control to make a change. Will you make the change? Now, some, they do love themselves. They love them some them. Y'all talk about it, but it's true. We know it. You know, some folks believe that they are actually perfect. They, they believe that they don't have any flaws at all. And I tell you that love of this nature is extraordinarily dangerous. It's extraordinarily dangerous for for a couple of reasons. The, the, The first reason being that love of this nature is simply blind and ignorant. Blind and ignorant because it blatantly chooses to ignore one's flaws. All of us have flaws today. And as I said before, the perfect person can never grow will never grow. The perfect person can never improve and will never improve. The perfect person, they cannot live for the better and will not live for the better. Secondly, love of this nature is extraordinarily dangerous because it is the love of this nature that caused Satan to sin and to rebel against the Lord. Mm -hmm. You see, love of this nature, it is filled with pride. Mm -hmm. Love of this nature, it is filled with ego. Mm -hmm. Love of this nature, it is overt in its selfishness. Mm -hmm. So love of this nature, we must be wary of. Because again, love of this nature It is driven by pride and it is driven by ego. And there is no prosperity that is available to anyone who is filled with love of themselves, self-love of themselves that goes to this extent. Mm -hmm. Self-love of this nature, it can only lead to one thing. It can only lead to sin. Mm -hmm. It can only lead to wickedness. Therefore, it can only lead to rebellion against God. Mm -hmm. And we know the end result of that. Mm -hmm. So we know the end of self-love that gets to that extent. Mm -hmm. So if we truly love ourselves, then we would learn to hold ourselves accountable Mm -hmm. for who we are. Mm -hmm. We would look in the mirror and we would see our flaws. And and when we see our flaws, then we will make a decision that is best for us. Mm -hmm. 
to move in a direction that can help us in our flaws, mm -hmm. that can help us in overcoming those flaws as well. Oh, yeah. And that's what we see James touch on here in his letter. Mm -hmm. This first chapter of James' letter, it jumps out to me as a chapter that focuses in on one's journey. Mm -hmm. He speaks here to how life is filled with trials and how life is filled with temptations and he speaks to what we need to do in order to be able to endure in those trials and those temptations as well. We'll see James say there in that 12th verse, he said, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, when he has been, in other words, judged by Christ, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Temptation, again, is what James spoke about there. And I feel like we need to touch on it here at the end of my sermon here. I feel like we need to touch on temptation for a moment because temptation, that's what often challenges our power and our authority. Mm -hmm. Temptation is what often challenges our rule and our control over ourselves. Mm -hmm. See, temptation, it is defined as the act of enticing evil. In other words, temptation tries to make you do what is evil. Mm -hmm. For all of us today, temptation, it is the same as it was for mankind in the garden. Now, some of us won't understand what that means, but temptation for us today is whether or not we are going to eat from the forbidden tree. As the children of God, we should know better than eating from the forbidden tree. As God again has given us his instructions mm -hmm. so that we do not disobey him. Mm -hmm. You know, for those that again will say, hey, well, what are, what are you talking about? I don't know what the tree is. God ain't pointed this tree out to me. Right. So not to speak so figuratively here. I want you to understand today that the forbidden tree is the world in which we live in today. We ought not eat of the world. You see, the fruit that is of the world is the way of the world. And again, we know that the way of the world, it stands in total opposition against the Lord. So we ought not be eating sinful fruit that is of the world. Yet many of us, we are enticed and we are pulled in by the fruit of the world. We are pulled in by the world's beauty by its riches, by its treasures. In fact, it seems that many of us, we, we take God's instructions not to eat from the fruit of this world. We almost seem to take it as an invite to go out and to do so. It's kind of like when we were little children and, and mom said, hey, don't you get no cookie before dinner. Or you're not going to want to eat dinner. And, you know, that that almost made you want to go and get that cookie even more. I want my snack. I get my snack all the time after school. That's how we used to think. But mama done got dinner ready early. And mama say, hey, don't eat, don't, don't eat before dinner because you're not going to be able to eat all your dinner. That's how many of us we begin to act when it comes to the world today. Like little kids that have been told not to do it. And like little kids, we go, oh, man, I'm going to get it. I'm going to sneak in now. I'm going to get it anyway. I'm going to sneak and get that cookie. Again, I tell you today that we can't let temptation have this kind of rule over us. We cannot let our temptation have this kind of power, this kind of authority over us. Again, James said that one who endures temptation will receive the crown of life, or as Paul called it, the imperishable crown. You see, the crown of life, that is a reward that is given to all of those who did not let go of their control, that did not let go of their power, who realized that they were in control of even their temptations. If you do not want temptation to rule over you, but you ultimately, again, desire to live for the better, and you desire to receive that crown, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his first letters that, you and I, we must learn to be 
disciplined. If you truly desire to live for the better, you must learn to be disciplined. You must learn to be disciplined in your faith. You must learn to be disciplined in your walk of faith. So when it comes to temptations and the enticing that is of the world, Paul called for you to remember that you are in control. He called for you to remain disciplined. In that familiar passage of scripture in first Corinthians and in the ninth chapter, Paul spoke to how the believer should be like a disciplined and trained athlete. Paul spoke to how the trained runner is temperate, how the trained runner is disciplined and not just a few things, but in all things. So rather than eating unhealthy, the trained athlete eats healthy, has a healthy diet so that they can be in peak condition. Rather than being lazy and lounging around, the trained athlete gets into shape. The trained athlete works out daily. The trained athlete, it actually goes about training daily so that they can be in peak condition. They are disciplined so that they can be again in peak health. And I wonder about us today as believers. And I wonder how many of us are in peak condition. I wonder how many of us as believers are in peak health today. I began to wonder how many of us have become dull of hearing. How many of us are adding on to our faith? How many of you are adding on to your faith today by diligently studying the word of God? You see, again, you are in control of diligently studying the word of God. Nobody can keep you from studying the word of God. Nobody can hold you back from studying the word of God. You are in control. You choose to diligently study the word of God and show yourself approved. You are in control. How many of you I begin to wonder today? are strengthening your faith by being diligent in your prayer life. Again, I tell you today that nobody is keeping you from being diligent in your prayer life. You say that you desire to live for the better, but again, how many of us are praying to live for the better? Again, you are in control of this. Nobody is holding you back from doing this. Again, I wonder how many of you today are adding to your faith by heeding God's word, by heeding God's rebuke, and then making the proper corrections in your life so that you can live for the better. Again, nobody is keeping you from heeding the word of God. You are in control of whether or not you will actually heed his word today. So again, we should learn to be disciplined so that we can prosper, so that we can grow, so that we can live for the better. An untrained athlete will never win a prize. And I tell you today that likewise, one who chooses not to live for the better will never live for the better. What will you choose today? Again, some of us, we choose to blame the Lord for how we live in this world. In other words, some of us, we choose to blame God for when we feel that we are not prospering the way that we desire to prosper. But James, he wrote there in the 13th verse, he said, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Do you really believe that the Lord does not want you to prosper today? Does God not want us to be fruitful as he desired to do when he created us? You see, why would God ever want us to fail? God does not want you to fail. So rather than blaming the Lord for we not living for the better, we must look in that mirror. 
as it says in my key verse for today, what keeps us from truly prospering is when we give away our power, when we give away our control, when we are enticed and when we are drawn away by our lust. And I want you to understand today that you are in control over your life. You have the power to overcome all obstacles that stand before you that may hinder you from living for the better. Even your own temptations, you are in control over that as well. I encourage you today for the rest of the year as well and for the rest of your life. Remember that you have the power. Remember that you are in control. Remember, you make the choice as to whether or not you will live for the better. Your faith in God, I tell you today, it will be rewarded. Your discipline, if you choose to be disciplined, again, it will be rewarded by the Lord. You will live for the better. You will prosper. Not only that, you will receive that crown of life, that imperishable crown. Amen. Amen. Amen.